Okay, our next speaker is, uh, is Con Ariti from, uh, from the Nuffield uh, Trust, where he's a senior research analyst. Um, Con previously actually was vice president of statistics at Capital One Bank uh, Europe, and also uh, a lecturer in medical statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, Con is going to be speaking about advanced analytics in health and social care. Thank you very much. And the lecturer came before the Vice President um, in chronological order. So if I can get this to work. So the rhythm of the morning has been very good. We've gone from very big picture navel gazing, navel gazing like who am I, a data scientist, down through the layers of data. And I'm actually really interested in uh, some case studies of the details of how we do things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hopefully three uh, case studies of using analytics in healthcare. Um, and talk a little bit more about the detail. So, uh, briefly about the Nutfield Trust. Um, this is actually a charitable organisation. We're known primarily as a healthcare think tank. Um, uh, this is Viscount Nutfield, William Morris, um, from uh, the car industry fame, endowed uh, the Nutfield Trust um, as a foundation, and we work as an independent organisation um, healthcare across the UK. Um, Prior to 2008, we primarily gave away the proceeds of that endowment for other people to do the research. Um, but since 2008, we've been doing a lot more of our own research in-house, um, and significantly more around uh, analysis and analytics, especially in the area of linked um, data sets. The Nuffield doesn't hold its own data. It, you know, we work on lots of different problems. And so one of the expertise that we've developed is linking data sets across health and social care. And so we kind of sit at that nexus of really research, slightly academic, and the whole sort of um, uh, public awareness of data sharing. So the whole care.data impacts on us quite, can impact on us quite considerably. Um, so we do a broad array of analytics um, that are relevant from predictive modeling, evaluations, resource allocation. I'm going to talk about an example from each of those three. I'm not going to talk about descriptive studies. They're not really in the same framework. Most of our work takes place um, in this wonderful organisation, National Health Service, um, which is an amazingly huge system, or much, I think more appropriately, it's an ecosystem. It's, it's a massive amount of moving parts. Um, Characteristic, it's large. We spend about 120 billion, um, or in 2012-13 is the budget for the NHS, it's about 8% of GDP. Um, and if you add to that the social care budget, which I think is around 20 billion as well, it's a substantial amount that we invest in, in the citizens' health and social care usage in, in the UK. It's a complex system. And I wish the purpose, I'm not sure if the person was here from the first talk about uh, graphics and what have you, but this is the helpful graphic the Department of Health issued in 2012 to explain the new health system. Now, the white bits in the middle actually provide health care. Everybody else either commissions health care or they look over the shoulder of people commissioning or providing health care. Um, an important sort of distinction to keep in the UK and the NHS is that there is a split. Uh, there is a commissioning part which, act, which sort of acts for a population to commission or purchase health care and then there's a provider piece which actually provides that health care. So the system is split along a provider um, and purchaser if you like uh, arm and that's important some of the work we do later on because some of our work is relevant to commissioners i.e. resource allocation, some to providers things like um, our predictive models. So it's a very large and complex system. What we would like to do in terms of our day-to-day -day work is to find out what happens on a journey as, as someone moves through this very complex um, system. So we have these what we call theograms, which are basically longitudinal views of the health, care, health and social care use of an individual. And that's kind of the data we want to get at. Now, in the NHS being a large and complex system, the data is everywhere. And it's at once nowhere, if you like. So each part of the system, this, this loosely based ecosystem, generates information that would be highly useful if it was all aggregated together, but unfortunately that doesn't happen. So you have the hospital system, which is relatively well organised with inpatient experience, outpatient clinics, accident and emergency attendances. You have all of the primary care, so general practice, all of community care, and then social care as well. So, so your interactions are being recorded, but they're not really being aggregated and brought together. And so, as I was sort of pondering this question, and I sort of, I'm, I'm kind of not 
I don't really like the name of big data. I don't think it means anything. Is it because it's long or wide or coming at you fast or slow? I thought the four Vs of big data um, was a good way of uh, summarizing. I wish I'd known before my talk, I would have given you some idea of where in the sort of four V taxonomy healthcare data is. So I've termed it loosely medium data. Um, so it's growing relatively quickly, about 125 million records a year in hospitals, 340 million in, in GP data, social care tens of millions, other sources from tens to millions. That would include things like ONS mortality data and things like that. But the key issue is it's, it's disparate, it's spread across many organizations. Uh, there are many types of variables recorded, so as simple as did you come to hospital today versus what is your um, blood glucose reading on a certain day, many, no standard formats, this, the unique identifier is often not used. And the last point, which has become very critical, is that it's now much harder to use, get permission to use data for research. And so information governance in, in the Nuffield is taking up a lot of our time. Because a typical project, a data flow in a project looks something like this. From operational systems, we gather hospital data, GP data, community data, social care data. That all is then pseudonymized, is, is encrypted. We then have to link that all together through this anonymization process. And then finally, we can come to the end and actually use the data for analysis. Um, so it's a, it's a complex way of doing things. Um, but the benefits we get from using all of these routinely collected data sets are that we have good coverage. It's, it's typically um, enables us to do retrospective studies um, and the volume of cases, which is often a problem in, in sort of small bespoke research, is not a problem. So if we want to look at the number of people who had a diabetes um, diagnosis last year, we can find that data very easily. Um, on the minor side, if you like, we have sort of constrained by what we can get. Um, this issue of handling sensitive data um, and also, some information is just not collected. So it's very difficult in routinely collected data sets um, to obtain smoking status, for example, on a regular basis, things like that. And the volume of data, even though not big by big data standards, is complex and, and the processing is, is complex as well. Um, so in terms of use of leaked data, uh, so Mark Walker talked this morning about um, things like performance management, um, research, and whatever. But I'm going to talk about three particular uh, projects, case studies we're involved. One is planning, which involves predictive modelling, resource allocation, and then evaluative services, which is something a little different and not normally sort of seen in outside of experimental situations. So I'm going to try and spend a bit more time on that at the very end. So predictive modelling. So as far as so we have various uses. There's case finding, for example, we want to go out and, and predict who might have a certain type of hospital admission. Resource allocation, evaluation, performance management, and so this. Pyramid ought to look very familiar for anybody who deals with risk management, with customer management, but essentially it's sort of you have, you want to stratify your, your population in terms of the intensity of intervention. So in healthcare, we might want to uh, take the top very few percent for very intensive case management, a lot of interaction, and then that sort of interaction reduces as you move down the sort of risk stratification until you get to the vast majority of people which sort of just need to be kept on the straight and narrow, if you like, various wellness programs, public health programs, clinics, screening, and what have you. So the idea of predictive modelling is that you have this risk stratification in place. Um, now, in some sense, healthcare was a little bit slow to, um, to the sort of predictive modelling framework, but a very influential paper came out in the British Medical Journal 2002 um, looking at the American healthcare provider, Kaiser Permanente. In fact, I can just go back. In some healthcare uh, circles, this is known as the Kaiser Pyramid. And the idea was that you were able to uh, stratify and look at different risk management using routinely collected data and all brought together. And so in a very short period of time, um, there were models developed that, could be, that were rolled out across the NHS, something called PAR, which stood for patients at risk of readmission, and the combined model, which included GP data. So the PAR model was essentially built on hospital data and the combined model on hospital and GP data. Now, readmissions are very important in our health service. Hospital uh, care is expensive, and so over a period of time, there's been a movement to move care out of hospitals and into the community. So knowing if someone's at risk of readmission allows you to intervene and then have some sort of program in place. So, so the case they want to talk about is a model we built for readmission within 30 days. Why 30 days, you might ask? Well, first of all, readmissions are very expensive. And for providers, so these are for hospitals, 
commissioners do not have to pay you for readmission that occurs within 30 days. It's, it's, it's a penalty to have someone come back in that short time period. And so, um, and so hospitals are very keen to figure out who might be coming back within 30 days so they can take some kind of action on them. And it's also um, in the, outcome, in the sort of, uh, NHS outcomes. It's a, it's a quality measure, if you like. And so the regular part model sort of sits in the, sits in the commissioners. They're trying to figure out who can we intervene on across the population. The 30-day model sits in the ward. And so at the time of discharge, you're trying to make an assessment. Uh, is this person likely to um, be readmitted in the next 30 days? And so we have a little checklist based on a predictive model using... Um, some very straightforward information drawn from hospital records, essentially some demographics, something about the area the person comes from, uh, many health outcomes are linked to deprivation, so it's always an important predictor. Um, have they recently been in hospital? What's this sort of history like? And finally, what kinds of other comorbidities, so what other things do they have wrong with them that might also indicate um, that they might be readmitted very soon? And at the very bottom is a kind of sort of financial calculator to figure out, you know, is this going to be an expensive case and how much could we in theory spend on an intervention? So if we have a whole toolkit of interventions, this is a high intensity intervention, low intensity intervention and so on. And so the predictive model allows in the ward to make that decision and have things like um, discharge support, uh, care in the home available when the person's discharged to avoid a readmission. And uh, so just for the statisticians amongst you, the Model predictive performance is quite good. Um, you know, the data is coming from routine data sources, not every variable is there. And as usual, the very high cost cases are very difficult to predict. Okay, so that's predictive modeling. I, I presume quite a few people would have seen that. Sort of resource allocation. This is a very large project um, to look at person based resource allocation. Now, surprisingly, it was a surprise to me entering healthcare. Resource allocation is a relatively new thing. And these are sort of a history of the various different resource allocation programs. Started about 1976. And the idea is you want to allocate the budget in proportion to the needs of your population you intend to purchase services from. And the trend you can see over time is that there's been a push to push that down to smaller and smaller populations, to be more precise at smaller populations. So you started off first of all very large regional areas, and now there's a focus on these on very small um, core cool. Uh, clinical commissioning group areas, which are responsible for populations around 250,000, buying in services for about a quarter of a million people. Um, but actually, the desire is to take that down to a lower level. So the model at current at the moment allocates to the commissioning groups on the basis of a roughly sort of area need. So we'll take into account the age, gender, ethnicity, structure, um, prevalences of common uh, long-term chronic conditions and so on. But the idea was to take that down to the practice level. So within your group, how can we allocate that to the practices which, where there's more variability, need to know something more about the individual. And so you have all your population, and then this is what your practice looks like. So here you have very few high-cost patients and quite a lot of low-cost patients. So your share, if you like, should reflect that. Um, so we... So the model was built using two years data to, for explanatory variables, one year prediction outcome. And importantly here, the costs are not slightly different from those who are familiar with things like profitability modelling. Here you have to reflect the needs rather than the use use. Because if you include use, you have the opportunity for gaming. So if, if GPs are performing lots of consultations and a great way to increase your allocations, perform lots of consultations. So, the, so variables that reflect use rather than need uh, need to be taken out of the model. And at the individual needs, things like you know, your age, your gender, your immediate uh, prior, prior diagnosis, your immediate service use. Area needs are things like prevalence of common chronic conditions, um, age structure of the area rather than the individual age of people. And supply side would mean things like how many GPs you have in your area, how easy is it for you to get to hospital, are there many diagnostic machines? So the model tries to incorporate that to, to allocate the resources. Um, very quick overview of the predictive variables. Obviously, a lot of it was around things like um, the previous utilisation, um, prevalences, and what have you, your, your diagnoses. In terms of model results, it's not surprising. At the individual level, the model performs quite, quite modestly. Individual level allocation is extremely hard to achieve, but when aggregated to the practice level, actually you get very good model fit. 
And so as a means of aggregating to the practice, this was a, this was a very nice way of, of making a fairer share that could be allocated across the commissioning, so basically across those that are purchasing services. And what's more, it's been rolled out in terms of something called the Fair Shares Toolkit. So this is a way for commissioners to uh, take results of the model, look at where they're currently allocating to the various practices, and then over time bring their current allocation together with what is predicted by the model as the fair share. Like many things you can't this year have an allocation, and next year have a completely different allocation. Practices are planning, and those things need to be brought together over time. And that is why the little graph is showing you, you're trying to bring them all down within the acceptable limits. You don't want practices that are very much over and above their uh, fair share calculation. So this is something that's very real and exists. Right, now, evaluation of complex interventions. Now, in a lot of work, for those of you who come from organisations where you can do experimentation. So you might experiment with different marketing programs, you might experiment um, with different processes. And it's relatively trivial to run planned experiments, even quite complex uh, experiments. Very difficult to do across the health system. It's very hard to have uh, a randomised experiment of something, uh, for example, like smoking cessation policy and so on. And so um, there's a need for evaluation. In fact, I wish uh, Sir Mark Walker had talked about it. One of the big things that has come um, with this government is a focus on getting evidence, a focus on evaluation. It's almost obsession with evaluations. And so um, we see that reflected in work in, 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 in our, in our, in our health care and social care work, which is also inhabited by professionals who come from evidence-based training. So you've got this marriage now, this sort of nexus of these two things happening. So really the key question is what works? Can we clarify the debate? And are the impacts we actually saw in the program real? Are they unbiased? And finally, can we link that to qualitative work? So we know, so we, we may be able to answer the question, it worked, but we have to link that to why did it work? And so another part of it is to refine programs, obtain feedback and learning. Um, you know, things don't get implemented properly, that needs to be folded in. And finally, even if the program as a whole may not have worked, did it work in special groups? So did it work in your high-risk population? So this sort of idea of exploring the subgroups as well is important. Now, what's, now, as I was referring to earlier, ideally, in a sort of conceptual framework, you would like to do a randomised control trial. I'm going to randomly allocate these folks to get an intervention, these folks to get another intervention. That might be fine for things like drug trials, medical devices, very simple interventions. But in system-wide interventions, it may not be possible to do. Um, you know, a, a, a group of practices may just take on themselves, they're going to take a different approach to managing cardiovascular disease, they're going to have different clinics, different rehabilitation. Um, and so they can't randomise because patients, it's impossible to do the randomisation. Um, even so, and so what's even a bigger problem is that even if you wanted to do a randomised trial at system level, often they're very poorly implemented. Um, I don't know if anyone's here is familiar with something called the whole systems demonstrator, but it was a trial of, a, a cluster randomised trial of telecare, and many issues have arisen from the implementation of the program that have cast serious doubts on the results. And so, rather than clarify the debate, it's in fact inflamed the debate around the efficacy of telecare and telehealth as a sort of whole systems uh, solution. So, um, poorly run trials, I'm not I'm saying it was a poorly run trial, but a trial that doesn't have uh, the credibility of good implementation um, can still reduce bias and still not lead to clarifying the debate. And also, trials are expensive. Trials are very expensive. You have to standardise protocols. You have to collect bespoke data and so on. So they're very expensive. So, so if you can't do a trial, could you do an observational study? So, you know, could we just run our intervention? We start the 1st of January. We look at six months. Wow, it's a success. It's much better than the previous six months. Well, typically no, because you need a comparable control group uh, to provide a fair assessment. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of natural experiments. We don't have, by chance, some practices doing nothing, and by chance, you're doing something else. They're almost identical in every feature to you, and so you have this natural experiment occurring. Very rarely happens. So we have to find some way of extracting the best possible value we can from observational studies. So we've got time. I want to briefly run through um, just some conceptual framework as to how we do this. So the problem boils down to really quite a simple one. It's like, 
you can only intervene once on the person. What you'd really like to do is intervene on them, take the measurement, pretend it didn't happen, take the measurement, take the difference, you're done. Unfortunately, it cannot happen because typically, even though the outcome you could be observed on both people, you only observe it on one person. And so you need to somehow get an estimate of what would have happened had you not intervened on that person. And so we can start to make some, random, some assumptions that help us get closer to the idea of randomization. And, and the sort of strong, one of the sort of common assumptions we make is say, given all the things that we can observe on you, so every bit of data we could collect, given that, then your outcomes, observed and unobserved, are independent of the intervention you've got. So, we sort of, so it's sort of like saying, if we, on, we know your age, your gender, blah, 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 so essentially we know all the things that would have selected you for the intervention, and so knowing those allows us to make this distinction. And it's quite a strong assumption, that's why it's, it's called the strong ignorability assumption. Um, and, and so you think, well, that's great, right? Problem is, I've measured 300 things, how do I account for those? So, um, Rose Vaughan and Rubin, back in the 80s, um, said, well, okay, you, if you can calculate a predictive score or a score, then that's as good as knowing all about the code group. You can summarize that information. And so this idea of what's called the propensity scoring evolved. So if you uh, match, if you like, on the propensity score, then you kind of mimicked random a randomization on all those variables that you that you actually measured. It's, a, it's also a very strong assumption. So it all boils down to this massive big theorem. So I apologise, I'm a statistician by training. Presentation doesn't involve a theorem or a big chart, it's not really a presentation. But here, basically matching on the score mimics randomization, and then we can go ahead and treat the data matched on the score as almost like randomization. So typically we'd match on demographics, on prior use, prior diagnoses, and then we try and assess how well we did by looking at how well these variables are balanced. So how well do the groups measure up in terms of their overall age structure, their gender structure, and so on. And we're sure that this, that this is comparable between the groups. Um, we have an in-house algorithm uh, using genetic algorithms that helps us with the matching, and it helps us achieve optimal balance. So we assess balance and overall group similarity, and we compare the means and distributions amongst the variables. So that's all great and conceptual. What do you, what do you mean in practice? Well, Here's my favourite chart. So, the, so what you really want here is that all of the solid blue dots are between the solid line and the dotted line. Because that's saying, on all of those variables I've measured, and here's the whole, there's 40 odd variables, these groups are very well balanced, very well matched. And so I can think of them as comparable. There are two variables that are slightly um, outside, but on the whole I've done a very good job. If you consider that the open circles are what the unmatched group look like, you know, they were terribly unbalanced, this is not comparable on practically any variable. So my matching is now brought them close together. And so I can just go ahead and analyze this as I normally would. I can include the matching variables to give me an extra sense of, um, of, of degree of comfort because I can then use them to, to sort of iron out any last minute imbalances. And I can look at sensitivity. So I can look at things like how, how strongly associated does another variable have to be for all the ones I measured to change the results I observed. So this chart, the contours show the various different effect sizes of my intervention, and the triangles and, and uh, crosses are all the variables I observed. So if I look at this chart, I think this is fine, because I would need to find a variable stronger than everything I looked at that would change the results of this intervention, that would change it to a non-significant or negative result. And considering that I've matched on age, gender, prior diagnosis, good luck finding that thing out there. So it gives me a sense of, a sense of comfort that there's no lurking variable. And so we applied this to um, Mary Curie Nursing Service. So this is a service provided for patients um, towards the end of their lives. And so what they were interested in was, you know, are participants more likely to die at home because that's their preferred choice? And did it result in a reduction of emergency admissions right towards the end of life? So, so their, their sort of philosophy is that you want people to be in, in a more comfortable end of life experience. You don't want them going to hospital all the time. And it's sort of subsidiary um, outcome was, did it actually reduce costs? Did, were they substantially reduced? So we had 30,000 individuals um, who received the Mary Curie Nursing Home Service, and we had a million individuals who died and did not receive the service who were available as matches. 
So these were sort of like the broad community. So we needed to find the 30,000 that were closest matches to our 30,000 intervention patients. And so we linked, um, we had the Mary Curie data, the ONS file mortality, and our hospital data. We linked those all together, ran them through the algorithm uh, to check how well we did matches. So here's the Mary Curie patients, here's their match controls. So on age, ethnicity, and deprivation, which are very strong uh, predictors, we had good matching. On the various comorbidities and cancer diagnosis, because it also uh, determined very strongly your service use. Again, excellent uh, match groups. And in terms of um, the outcomes, so for Mary Curie, about 70% of people um, are dying at home, very you know, much fewer in the hospital or hospitals. And for the match controls, much fewer at home, many more in hospital, many more in hospitals. And in terms of uh, admissions, so the service starts about seven days prior to death. This was the Mary Curie experience prior to the instruction, the, the introduction of the service. This was the control group. You can see mirroring that trajectory very closely. Here's the Mary Curie folks after the service, and here's the control group after the service. So a considerable difference. And just looking at service costs, um, you can see that there was a large reduction in, in the use of services for the Mary Curie patients. Um, clearly, this, this doesn't include the cost of the service, so overall um, there was a reduction, but when, once you take into account the costs, which are hard to estimate, um, it's much more reduced. So the benefits here are fantastic. You're able to use all of our routinely collected and linked data. You're able to construct your control group. Um, it's, it's a very powerful way of doing evaluations where you can't do randomization, but you're trying to achieve the same effect. Clearly, if you have very strong variables you didn't measure, then that may bias the results. And you can't get carried away. Your routine data has to have the outcome and the relevant information. So this morning we talked about data looking for a question. Here, the question has to come first in the data set. I have some final thoughts, um, sort of more broader-based thoughts around analytics and healthcare in general. Um, it's an evolving, it's an evolving um, path, and it's probably not as far along as some other industries like finance and what have you. Some individual organisations are quite a ways along the path, uh, so some individual providers. Um, but actually, even though we, we concern ourselves with research, we think about data in that context, many healthcare providers are struggling with sharing data operationally. So I don't know if you've had the experience of going to clinic A in a provider, you go to clinic B, literally around the corridor, and you have to fill in the same forms. So, in some sense, the sort of abstract argument about care data as a sort of research tool versus operationally sharing information, um, you know, you put the operational sharing first, and I think that's what they have, but in Scotland is a good example of actually sharing operational information for treatment, and that's a much easier sell to, um, to users than the conceptual basis of some research data. So, I think there's still a long way to go to solving the operational considerations. There's massive opportunities here to form better decisions, Lots of scope for things that we actually think about as traditional tools, modelling, optimisation, human theory, and so on. Um, and finally, um, in terms of research, balancing this potential use, potential value, and user confidentiality, I think remains paramount. I think Simone Walcott talked about care data this morning, and, and certainly um, the quote from Ben Goldape is very powerful, uh, certainly powerful on the operational front, um, but I think the sort of uh, mismanagement communication around care data has done a lot to make an apprehensive public resistant to more data sharing, especially for the purpose of research. And I'll finish there. Okay, it's time for some questions. I see Dr. Hand. Yeah. Behind you, oh, oh yes, all right, yeah. Uh, Jeff Royce from the Royal Society. Um, your predictive uh, model, to some extent the uh, planning model, raised the question which you uh, alluded to of how um, accurate the predictions are, and obviously there's some inaccuracy there. Um, how do you approach the issue there, particularly with the part-time models, of how good does the prediction have to be for the model to be useful? No, that's, uh, that's a very good question. I think. I mean, it's sort of like you, 
do the cost benefit analysis because remember the model is just one part. So part of it is the interventions you have to target against the risk gratification you do. So if you have a, so if your only intervention is very expensive, then the, target, the model would need to perform at a much higher level because that, that would mean identifying very specifically that the risk of a false positive would cost you a lot. So I think it all depends on what array of interventions you have to be able to do the cost benefit analysis against the model in itself. Clearly, I mean, if the model performed very poorly, you're getting very poor discrimination at any level, and that would be an issue. Um, but if you're just trying to identify the top 1% to apply a, quite an expensive intervention to, then I think model performance is probably fine. As so if you've got moderately expensive interventions that run down the risk uh, stratification, the model is not doing a very good job of who might be most amenable to those, and I think you have an issue. But by itself, I think the model needs to be seen in, in performance, it's only seen in context of what you could apply against it. Uh, so there's a question to uh, John, no, just behind, I was just going to go back first. Done. Yes, so Steve, Mike, um, I've got a question um, about resource allocation models in healthcare. Um, and basically I'm wondering how do you deal with some of the problems you get um, about understanding the difference between need and historic activity. So there's, there's the idea that, for example, if you have a lot of hospital beds, you tend to use a lot of hospital beds, but not because the patients need it, simply because there's provider-driven demand. So if you're using historic data about healthcare activity and trying to understand how that relates to actual healthcare need, do you not bias the results unless you find a clever way to deal with that? So we've got any, any ideas? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, with, with the PBRA model, um, that issue came up, it's, you know, it's like issue number one, um, and the working group around it literally went through tens and tens of needs, supply side, and utilization variables to kind of come up with, if you like, an expert panel's guide to what should be included in the modeling um, the variables that you would include for modelling. So I don't think there's any um, specific advice in terms of individual um, characteristics other than those where, certainly those where gaming is very easy to do. Um, so, so no, so I mean, here it was based on expert, expert opinion, really. Did you still guess so there's a question in the front as well? from those from the Government Operational Research in at Revenue and Customs. Um, actually, I think my questions are a related one, because um, I was considering the application of the model and thinking that um, obviously you've got the model, you've got the model actually driving a focus of resources, which is then dri driving data collection. Um, do you then have a risk about how the model then would be tuned going forward? Does it get overtrained? Does it get overfocused? And that sort of thing. Uh, I think the answer is, is yes, and, um, and, it's, yeah, and, and so then you look to, looking at sort of model monitoring, revalidation. I mean, one of the things here is that at the time, the, the model was going to be used for allocations in 11 12, but delays in the data meant you were using 08 09. So there's sort of a, a lag effect there, and then there's the forward going effect. And so I think the idea is to continually refine these models over time to make sure they're actually, they're actually reflecting the type of thing that they're trying to do. But you do get influence. Of the, of the model itself into the future. So yes, yeah, so you can't really escape that. It's sort of a natural thing is sort of action drives consequence, drives new actions and so on. Yeah, it's, it's, I think the idea is you can't think of this as like set in stone. And if you look at the history of resource allocation, clearly they were struggling with that question at a very high level well before then. You know, their resource decisions were then creating unforeseen for, uh, so they then changed again and so on. Um, but this was, sort of to, this was sort of attempting to address the problem at a much more granular level. Yeah, and for, on the question we had to, this, we presented this model before, and uh, a very eminent professor of health policy asked the question, you know, why not just give me my own personal budget from the model, and I would take that and do with it what, what I liked, and um, it sort of, you sort of, sort of talk about this idea, well, there's a very poor prediction, you know, it's needs rather than use, and so on, so, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not quite down to that level. I think we just have time for one further question, if there's... Anybody out there? 
Looks like everybody wants their lunch, I think. So uh, at that point, we'll, we'll break for lunch back here at, uh, at half past one, and uh, we'll be going to the second session there.